Oh, it was almost past uh, uh, Francis Young, I believe, was the DEA administrative judge who, my understanding was, basically suggested that it be made a Schedule II According to government documents, the DEA's administrative law judge, Francis Young, found there was incontrovertible evidence that cannabis was an effective medical treatment for nausea and appetite loss, multiple sclerosis and spinal cord injury spasms. Judge Young ruled marijuana should be moved to Schedule II, writing, the evidence in this record clearly shows that marijuana has been accepted as capable of relieving the distress of great numbers of very ill people. It would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious for DEA to continue to stand between those sufferers and the benefits of this substance. For those who were concerned about marijuana's side effects, Young ruled that as a medicine under a doctor's supervision, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. The DEA and other federal agencies disagreed. They overruled Judge Young's decision and kept marijuana on Schedule I. But the ruling did add to growing pressure on the U.S. government to go beyond its own compassionate use program and make marijuana legally available as a medicine. The answer? Provide a pill that can do what the plant does. For years, the government had been sponsoring and funding research to put the active ingredient in marijuana, THC, into a capsule form. Known as dronabinol or marinol, the drug is a synthetic version of THC created in the laboratory. Since it did not come directly from the plant, the DEA placed it on Schedule II. They wanted to have an answer to people like me. There is a medicine out there that people can buy. They don't have to use herbal marijuana. Dr. Grinspoon says the problem is marinol does not work as well as marijuana. You take people who have used both herbal marijuana, smoked it or ingested it, and Marino or Durdambino. Every time, never an exception, oh, I much prefer uh, herbal marijuana. It was my experience when AIDS patients first started taking Durdambinol back in 1992 that they didn't like it. The absorption when taken orally of THC is very variable and low. The gut only absorbs 12 percent, plus or minus a few percent depending on the individual. The problem with taking it through the gut, you have to wait for an hour and a half to two hours to know whether you're getting relief from the pain or the nausea or whatever it is you're trying to relieve. How does Marinol compare in all this? I was talking earlier, I mean, do you feel like it's as effective as the plant or no? No. I do not believe Marinol is as effective as, as marijuana or THC. And why do you say that? I've never really seen it work. We've added on, it's expensive, and I've never had a patient who seemed to get much benefit from it. We really haven't had very much success with patients with Marinol for any um, side effect management. So there's something that is lost in, um, with the THC in that processing. Dr. Abrams says what's lost in the processing are all the other cannabinoids in the plant, some of which are known to mitigate the high associated with THC, making the patient feel more relaxed instead of anxious. There are 400 other compounds in the plant, including 70 other sort of look-alikes to Delta 9 THC, and those are all there for a reason. They provide balance, if you will, the yin and the yang. And, you know, my opinion that you lose that balance when you remove the single most psychoactive component from the plant and, and use that as a pharmaceutical. I've used Marinol uh, on some patients selectively. Uh, I've not had any problem with Marinol. Dr. Voth says while he's not overly impressed with Marinol, he would rather have patients take a pill. He says telling a patient to smoke an illegal plant is substandard medicine. I treat a lot of sick patients with all sorts of different pain and neuropathic disorders and cancer, etc. And I cannot think of one circumstance in 27 years of active practice that I've had to say, well, it's time for you to smoke dope. I just haven't. And that includes terminal patients and hospice patients. Anyone who says that, you know, we have adequate treatments for all of the conditions for which marijuana is purported to have uh, some effect. I don't think that is a correct statement. I, I think the fact is that we have a lot of difficult to treat conditions and there may be a niche or a place for the cannabinoids uh, with some of those conditions. 
Oncology social worker Wendy Gwenner agrees. She's personally seen patients who don't get adequate relief from the anti-nausea drugs. And when it comes to getting patients to eat... It is far and away the best medication that we have for chronic wasting and for increasing appetite in cancer patients. There's probably nothing that works as well for appetite stimulation that we have as, as marijuana. But Dr. Hensold says cannabis does have one side effect that certain patients don't like, namely the high. Most of the side effects I worry about with patients are really the, the euphoria and the altered sense of consciousness that people get um, and whether they'll tolerate that or not. Generally, you'd consider a high as an adverse effect. So <clears throat> that adverse side effect for people who don't want to be high is really a problem. For other patients, though, the high could be part of the therapeutic effect. A 1999 U.S. Institute of Medicine report on marijuana found the drug's anti-anxiety and sedative effects could be a benefit. I can't convince myself that the psychoactive part doesn't play a part. If they feel good, that's terrific. But does feeling good lead to addiction? Absolutely. Marijuana is habituating, addictive, whatever you want to call it. Dr. Voth says marijuana has about the same addictive potential as alcohol. The 99 government report found marijuana was slightly less addictive than alcohol, with 9% of all users experiencing addiction. And marijuana does not have the extreme physical withdrawal symptoms that alcohol and other drugs do. Potential for withdrawal is, is really minimal because uh, the cannabinoids are stored in fat so that if you stop using marijuana abruptly, it still leaches out from fat over a number of days so you don't get a precipitous withdrawal. Regardless of the mild withdrawal symptoms, Dr. Voth believes marijuana's side effects and its addictive potential are just a few of the factors that make it unattractive for drug companies to research. I think it's very unlikely that marijuana <clears throat> will ever make it through the FDA. It's the fact that you're smoking dope that you're smoking a plant. You're smoking something with 488 substances in it. So there's the rub. Schedule 1 is a side issue. It may chill things a little, but it's really that you're looking at smoking dope at, as a medication. Dr. Voth is not the only one concerned about smoking. The 99 Institute of Medicine report says smoked marijuana is a crude THC delivery system that also delivers harmful substances. There's a lot of things that have hit the, the literature that have talked about head and neck tumors, for instance, um, oral tumors, lung cancers even. The Institute of Medicine found that marijuana smoke can deposit up to four times the amount of tar in the lungs of a cannabis smoker as a tobacco smoker. Studies have also shown that marijuana smoke contains higher concentrations of the same carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. While scientists are concerned these factors may lead to lung cancer, they still have not found definitive proof. And patient Point Hatfield says smoking is worth the risk. The thing about smoking the marijuana is it's immediate. You don't wait 20 minutes or half an hour or whatever. It's immediate. And for me, immediate relief was a blessing. When you smoke cannabis, by the way, the peak concentration in the bloodstream occurs in two and a half minutes. When it goes through your lungs, it goes into the right side of the heart, into the left side of the heart, and then right up to the, br to the brain. Most people prefer the inhalation method because they can better titrate when the effect comes on, how long it lasts. Dr. Grant says until someone comes up with a fast-acting inhaler, smoking may be their best option. I'm not sort of in the camp of people who say, well, I grant you marijuana may work, but it's absolutely unacceptable because it's smoked. Uh, I don't think that's right. Do you worry about patient smoking? I, I don't. I look at the cost benefit. The cost of having untreated cancer would be far outweigh whatever carcinogens might be introduced to the lungs. Even Irvin Rosenfeld, a patient who smokes 10 to 20 marijuana cigarettes a day, doesn't waste any time worrying about the smoke. No. Why not? First of all, I have over 200 tumors in my body that could go malignant. I should live so long as to die of lung cancer. Okay. 
A 2006 lung cancer study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse gives Rosenfeld even more to smile about. Researchers unexpectedly found that chronic, heavy marijuana smokers not only had no increased risk of developing lung cancer, but they actually had a decreased risk. Marijuana contains anti-inflammatory, uh, antioxidant, and probably anti-cancer compounds in it. This is where the complexity of the plant is both a blessing and a curse. With dozens of cannabinoids and hundreds of other compounds, it's difficult to pinpoint the source of the beneficial effects found in the smoking study. There are challenges in doing research on something that has, you know, 150 different chemicals in it. Critic Dr. Eric Voth believes the true medical potential of cannabis lies in targeting some of those chemicals, not smoking the entire plant. There are elements in the cannabinoids and various cannabinoids that have a lot of positive effect and very little addictive or uh, high causing effects. Scientists have managed to isolate and focus attention on one of those. It's called cannabidiol and next to THC it's one of the most abundant cannabinoids in the plant. CBD is cannabidiol which is another cannabinoid uh, like the main psychoactive ingredient but Instead of getting people high, CBD seems to be a very potent anti-inflammatory and analgesic. So it relieves pain and decreases inflammation. But what I'll do 